Everything's Bigger in America claims documentary and Morgan Spurlock in the 2004 documentary Supersize Me. The fattest state in America, according to this film, is Mississippi, and he later says that Houston, Texas is the fattest city in America. When we hear this information, we're meant to be like, wow, that's terrible, even though those statements mean absolutely nothing. You could say Michigan has the shortest men, and it would have the same effect on me. He talks about the Pelman v. McDonald's case where two black teenagers sued McDonald's for quote-unquote making them obese. He frames this as ridiculous because people should know by now that McDonald's food is unhealthy. Morgan then asked what would happen if he ate nothing but McDonald's for a month. I mean, what would happen if I ate nothing but McDonald's for 30 days straight? Would I suddenly be on the fast track to becoming an obese American? Would it be unreasonably dangerous? Let's find out. I'm ready. Supersize me. He then plays Fat Bottomed Girls by Queen during the opening title sequence, which is just great. Thanks, Morgan, for using a great song for your shitty documentary. He tells his doctors that he doesn't have any major health conditions. He's asked if he drinks alcohol, and he says no. Put a pin in that. He is told by one of his doctors that he could possibly raise his cholesterol from his diet and might put his heart at risk. We meet his girlfriend, who is a vegan chef. She is deeply disturbed by this experiment and doesn't want him to do it. She's one of those people who thinks that all fast food is like Franken food. At one point, she refers to meat consumption as comparable to using heroin. Ham is the greatest sure thing heroin ever. Heroin is awesome. <laughs> I'm sure it's heroin great. and ham are in completely different categories. I'm sorry, but ham and heroin are not the same thing. They're not. Morgan explains to us the rules of this experiment. There are rules to what's going on here in this whole process. I will only supersize it if they ask me. And I can only eat things that are for sale over the counter at McDonald's. Water included. If McDonald's doesn't sell it, I can't eat it. I have to have everything on the menu at least once over the next 30 days. And I have to have three squares a day. Morgan interviews people on the street and asks people questions about whether or not they eat fast food and then ask them their thoughts on the Pullman v. McDonald's case and other cases of people suing McDonald's for their weight gain. Fast food companies. Yes, yes, yeah. I've heard. Yeah. I think it's ridiculous, but it's, uh, it's uh, the American way to sue for uh, everything. If I can walk by them and just totally ignore them and say, I'm not hungry, I don't need this, they can do it too. We don't have to go there. You know, we don't have to shop with them. We can easily go in McDonald's and grab a salad, but we choose not to. David Satcher, the former Surgeon General, says he believes fast food restaurants are a major contributor to quote-unquote obesity. We begin seeing consistent B-roll footage of headless fat people as interviewees talk about how we live in a toxic, inactive environment that encourages unhealthy eating habits. Morgan then talks about how Americans rely too much on cars and machines to get around. It's a world where people depend completely on their cars for transportation and where walking has become such a chore that we rely on machines to do it for us. So if you're disabled and need things like electric wheelchairs to get around, uh, fuck you, I guess. David Satcher says that if we don't do something about obesity, obesity would overtake smoking as the leading preventable cause of death in America. So the film takes the classic anti-fat stance of comparing smoking to fatness, even though the two cannot be compared because smoking is a habit and being fat. It's not a habit that someone can just drop. Morgan interviews some rando who says that it's socially acceptable to harass smokers for smoking, but not to harass fat people. One is now socially acceptable to hector smokers, but the other one isn't quite yet. So the question is, at what point will it become acceptable to publicly hector fat people uh, in the way that, that, that smokers are publicly hectored? This isn't an uncommon claim made by people who are proudly fatphobic and extremely ignorant. It's just stupid because it is 100% acceptable and even encouraged to be shitty to fat people. That's not some like forbidden truth <laughs> that like right. that like fat people are like bad. You can't even say it in America anymore. No, that's the consensus position of every right. institution of American life. You are not a bold truth teller. Right. It's not <laughs> edgy to be like, oh, yeah. fat people suck. That's the <laughs> fucking status quo. And get a scene of Morgan tying a shit ton of health conditions to weight gain and fatness. Hypertension, coronary heart disease, stroke, gallbladder disease. Osteoarthritis, adult onset diabetes. 
This is where it becomes clear what the overall message of the film is, which is that if you're fat and you happen to develop some sort of health condition, it's your fault and you shouldn't have been so stupid by eating fast food and ice cream. Jared Fogel, yes, that Jared, is introduced and we get a clip of him speaking at a high school about his weight loss journey. There's an incredibly weird and sad moment where he talks to this poor 14-year-old girl and her mom. Her mom talks about all the things she's doing to manage her 14-year-old daughter's weight and she talks about it as if it's a good thing. Her daughter then talks to the camera about the advice Jared gave her. And it's kind of hard because I can't afford to like go there every single day and buy a sandwich like two times a day. And I've tried other ways and it kind of hurt my body from doing other ways that I've tried to do. And it's kind of hard to like look at someone who said, hey, I've done it so you can do it, but it's not that easy. Morgan doesn't really make a comment about this. We just swiftly move past this moment like it didn't happen. There's even a small moment where her mom talks about how kids don't make it easy, implying that her daughter has been bullied for her weight. And then Jared says, the world's not going to change, so you have to change, which is just so fucked up. And it's a part of this fucked up logic around fat phobia, where we're totally fine with abuse and bullying when it is aimed at fat children. Like, it's fine to bully kids and fat people, but in any other context with any other body type, we would immediately view that as unacceptable behavior. And it's really wild to me that culturally we have all gotten on board with like, yeah, actually, for some groups of people, you have to publicly abuse and shame them for their own good, right? That we have all sort of collectively bought into this logic that we would absolutely not stand for in individual relationships. John Robbins, who is an heir to the Baskin Robbins empire, talks about how much he loved ice cream growing up and that he ate ice cream for every meal. He talks about his uncle who was about 240 pounds and died of a heart attack and assumes that his weight caused it. He talks about Ben Cohen, co-founder of Ben & Jerry's, who apparently had major weight loss surgery at the age of 49, and other people in his family who died of heart attacks. He then says that you just cannot deny the links. He doesn't appear to have any other evidence of why these people had heart attacks. He just flat out assumes, as many people do, that these people died of being fat, essentially. He is blaming these people, many of whom are his family members, for their deaths. There's a section about school lunches where he talks to the lunch ladies about the kinds of foods the kids eat. He talks about how much sugar is in the drinks as if the lunch lady has any control over that. There's a really fucked up moment where this man talks about how we could end up with young people who can read but are fat. Because as it always is with the moral panic around obesity, it's not really about health, it's about our disgust for fatness. Because why would it be a bad thing if a kid is fat? Kids aren't responsible for anything, much less their weight. And if you're so concerned about fat kids and their health, then why are you saying incredibly stigmatizing and fucked up things about their bodies and essentially telling them that their bodies are wrong and that they need to be fixed? That doesn't exactly contribute to healthy self-esteem, I'm sorry to tell you. Throughout the film, Morgan talks about how addictive the food is. He claims to acquire headaches when he doesn't eat it and that eating more McDonald's made him feel better, which just feels very overstated and fake. There's a part about quote-unquote heavy users, and he animates these quote-unquote heavy users as very fat people wearing leggings and sweatpants. He talks to a guy named Bruce who is diabetic and is about to get weight loss surgery. They then show inside footage of the procedure, which I felt was very distasteful and unnecessary. Honestly, the whole documentary is distasteful and unnecessary, so what did I expect? Towards the end of the documentary, Morgan tells us the Pelman v. McDonald's case was dismissed because the two girls failed to produce any evidence that eating McDonald's caused their injuries. In only 30 days of eating nothing but McDonald's, I gained 24 and a half pounds. My liver turned to fat and my cholesterol shot up 65 points. One of his doctors talks about how she was shocked to learn that McDonald's could also attack your liver. He says that even though his experiment was extreme, it wasn't unrealistic. Even though it was. He then proposes a very conservative, libertarian stance, which essentially amounts to, McDonald's is bad, so don't eat there. The documentary pretends to be about corporate responsibility, but all it really amounts to is portraying McDonald's customers as fat idiots, who need to learn to take personal responsibility for their health outcomes. After this documentary was released, McDonald's eventually got rid of its supersized option. 
In that same episode of Maintenance Phase, Aubrey Gordon mentions that there was then a wave of corporations eliminating their extra large sizes. So like shortly after this happens, sort of Wendy's and other chains follow suit. Wendy's announces that it's eliminating its biggie size. So (laughs) Wendy says they're eliminating their biggie size. What they don't say is that they're changing the name of the biggie size to a large. They're changing the name of a large to a medium and they're changing the name of a medium to a small. Right. It's just fucking optics, right? Right. This is also around the same time that candy companies phased out king size like we don't have king size candy bars anymore quote unquote is that true yeah so they were like we're doing away with king size we've heard you the health concerns are real blah 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 blah. and then like a few months later things start showing up on shelves that are king size but they're labeled sharing size nice like go share it with other people you can't say we didn't (laughs) tell you to share it However, despite the fact that this documentary has been praised for forcing corporations to promote healthier eating habits, it did no such thing. A reporter did an experiment where they realized that there wasn't that big of a difference between a large size and a super size. The super size soda contained more ice than the large size, but had the same amount of soda. As for the super size fry, well, the super size contained two more fries than a large. So, uh, yeah, not that big of a difference, huh? If you're a young millennial or an older Gen Zer, such as myself, you were probably shown this film in health class. I remember watching it in eighth grade and again in ninth and hadn't watched it since until now for this video. It was actually astonishing how anti-fat and stigmatizing this documentary was. There is no question that the film was meant to make viewers feel disgusted by fat people and their bodies. To view fat people as gross and immoral. The amount of B-roll footage of headless fat people was truly astounding. You do not present footage like that as a way to raise awareness for health. It is solely meant to body shame and perpetuate anti-fat bias, period. If me and my classmates took anything away from this documentary, it was to fear becoming fat and to hate fat people. One of the major revelations about this documentary over 10 years later was that in 2017, when Morgan Spurlock came forward admitting to sexually assaulting a woman when he was in college, inadvertently admitted that his liver damage may not have solely been caused by his 30-day McDiet. One of the biggest sort of smoking gun things that this film presents is that Spurlock had significant liver damage right from 30 days just one month of eating this way and he's like oh my god look look what happened to my liver Mm -hmm. so the film doesn't offer us any explanation for that liver damage other than 30 days of mcdonald's Mm -hmm. in 2017 morgan spurlock disclosed that he was an alcoholic and said that he had been drinking every week he had not been sober for a week since he was 13. Oh. Right? Decades and decades of hard drinking. And then at the end of this film, they're like, oh my God, look at the liver damage you sustained just from one month of McDonald's is sort of what you're meant to conclude from that. Yeah. I would honestly argue that without that information, this documentary still wouldn't have been very convincing because most people who eat fast food are poor, but they aren't eating McDonald's every single day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's insane and can become extremely expensive. But with this information, it just kind of confirms my own uncomfortable feelings I had about this film when I was younger. I was always a little skeptical, but I could never articulate why. There were also rebuttal documentaries and experiments of people trying to copy Morgan's experiment, who for one, couldn't get to 5,000 calories a day, and some who lost weight from eating nothing but McDonald's. These documentaries really didn't address the other glaring issues with Super Size Me, In fact, the Maintenance Phase podcast episode on this documentary was the first time I heard anyone mention the anti-fat bias within it. The problem is that the ideals and messages we are meant to take away from this are things that people on the left have advocated for. Super Size Me is not a scapegoat. It's not an isolated incident. I think it is a great example of how even the most progressive people have major blind spots for one of the most marginalized groups of people in our country. Every year. Pawnee Cares teams up with the local cable access station to raise money for diabetes research. And it's important because Pawnee is the fourth fattest town in the U.S. It goes us, uh, Dallas, Tulsa, and certain parts of the Mall of America. In an article posted on Medium, author and activist Aubrey Gordon wrote about the Mara Lardas hashtag that trended on Twitter in 2019. The hashtag was created to fat shame former President Donald Trump. 
I sat at my laptop, a lifelong fat person and a lifelong progressive, watching it all unfold. My stomach sank, turning in on itself, as thousands of anti-Trump tweets targeted him not for his racism, xenophobia, transphobia, ableism, misogyny, proud history of sexual assault, destructive policies, bold power grabs, or the vast and serious harms he's causing in communities across the country and around the world. Instead, they posted pictures of his belly, his buttocks, his double chin, photographs that didn't look fat enough or enhanced to look even fatter, one person after the next, people with equality and ally in their Twitter bios. Tick aim not at Trump's actions, but at his body. She talks about how people on the left who are making these fat phobic tweets try to justify their blatant body shaming by implying that because Trump himself is a bully and is a horrible person, it was totally fine to fat shame him on a public platform. I sat at my keyboard feeling despondent, powerless, exhausted and perplexed in equal measure. I understood their responses, feeling so driven to anger, so impotent that shouting schoolyard insults at strangers felt like the only rejoinder. If I can't make him stop, at least I can make him hurt. But hurt hasn't stopped his virulent anti-immigrant rhetoric, it hasn't tempered his misogyny, and it hasn't ended his presidency. There was no strategy here. Just the frustrated belief that any retaliation might be useful. I thought about the fat people who would read those tweets in the tsunami of proud mockery of fat bodies. I thought about the people who would feel emboldened in their desire to shame and shout down fat people by the simple virtue of our bodies. I thought about myself among them. How thin was the ice where I stood? How many political disagreements would it take for my body to be ridiculed this way? Which of my friends, family, colleagues would use the hashtag? How long would their gleeful laughter ring in my ears? How much of my suffering would they need to see in order to consider a simple request for decency? When could my actions as a fat person be considered on their own merit, divorced from the body that was seemingly to blame for so much? Once again, my body was expendable. I have talked to people on the left in the past about this, and some of the people I've talked to have said they feel frustrated by this idea that leftists always have to be the bigger person. Why must we go high when they go low? People on the right have no shame and won't even hesitate to make someone's appearance the butt of a joke or to senselessly dunk on them. Although I understand this line of thinking, I have to ask, what good does it do to fat shame Donald Trump? And why is it that when it comes to people we deeply dislike and disagree with for totally understandable reasons... We decide that body shaming is fine, actually. As Aubrey pointed out, Donald Trump is bad for a million reasons that have literally nothing to do with his weight. If he was thin, he'd still suck as a human being. What's fascinating to me is that people on the left are so willing to just throw fat people under the bus if it gets them some laughs and likes on Twitter. This has happened so many times before. Having to choose between the movement I love and the only body I have. Hashtag moral ass is so far from the first time my fellow progressives have made their feelings about bodies like mine abundantly clear. For years, the American left has attacked its opponents, created public policy, and written off voters, all in the service of anti-fat bias. So what exactly is anti-fat bias? Well, to put it simply, it's being biased against fat people and having prejudicial assumptions about fat people. Some of those assumptions may include... Assuming all fat people are going to have an early death, that fat people are lazy, that fat people struggle with binge eating disorder, that fat people are not trying hard enough to lose weight, etc., etc. The interesting thing about anti-fat bias is that it is so pervasive and is so encouraged in our society that even people who would consider themselves to be progressive and inclusive of all marginalized people still hold on to these anti-fat beliefs. Anti-fat bias doesn't even register as something that they should confront or even address. Many people, especially on the left, don't think about the ways that fat people are systemically disenfranchised. From not receiving proper medical care because their doctors are also fat phobic, from being discriminated against on airplanes because airplane seats don't always accommodate for people on larger bodies, to jobs being able to literally fire people based on their size. People do not think about these things outside of body positivity. Fat activism isn't just about people feeling good about their bodies, although that is a great goal. It's about eliminating size-based discrimination. Regardless of whether or not you still want to believe that being fat automatically equates to poor health outcomes, fat people still deserve to be treated with dignity and respect, just like everyone else. 
Sadly, this is something many leftists do not care to think about because they still perpetuate fat phobia when it's convenient for them. The same people who say they love Lizzo are sometimes the same people who can't wait to call Trump a fat piece of shit as if his weight is the worst possible thing about him. I remember reading this Playboy article about Michael Shannon when he was asked if he would ever play Donald Trump. He immediately shut down the suggestion and was asked what his thoughts were on what goes through Donald Trump's head. He says, quote, when he's alone with his thoughts, he's not capable of anything more complex than, I want some pussy and a cheeseburger. Maybe my wife will blow me if I tell her she's pretty. This hatred of fatness and fat people causes people to presume that all fat people are just lazy bastards who don't care about anything else but eating cheeseburgers. Speaking of cheeseburgers... In the popular and beloved NBC sitcom Parks and Recreation, there is a fictional restaurant called Ponch Burger. The logo for said restaurant features a silhouette of a fat person. Advertisements for the restaurant show sloppy cheeseburgers with three beef patties and french fries with chili and cheese globbed on top. Put it in your body, reads the slogan. Ponch Burger is clearly a parody of fast food restaurants. And boy, does Parks and Rec have a real bone to pick with the fast food industry. A running joke throughout the series that the city they live in, Pawnee, is quoted as first in friendship, fourth in obesity. In almost every season, there is an episode dedicated to Leslie Nope pushing measures to fight against obesity. Some of those measures include implementing a soda tax and stopping a new Ponch Burger from being built on Lot 48. This is a clear reflection of what was going on in the real world during this time. Democrats targeted fast food corporations as a way to fight against the fake obesity epidemic. In the soda tax episode, Leslie talks about how absurd the drink sizes are, and Anne tells her that a tax on soda will definitely lower diabetes in Pawnee. Which, like, how? How would that lower diabetes, Anne? They also include footage of headless fat people during the episode as well. So not only is this show perpetuating the common misconception that sugar is the sole cause of diabetes, it's also overtly trying to gross out viewers by exploiting the bodies of fat people and treating them as if they are not people. You know, like in Super Size Me. As I mentioned before, the literal logo for Ponch Burger is a silhouette of a fat person. And when the Restaurant Association plans to build another Ponch Burger, the slogan reads, Start Drooling Fatties. One of the photos used as a cover for Super Size Me is a picture of a fat Ronald McDonald. Both Super Size Me and Parks and Rec perpetuate this idea about fast food and fat people, that fast food causes fatness and that fat people are just so dumb and fat that fast food is like catnip for them. All you have to do is advertise grossly sloppy cheeseburgers and large drink sizes and they'll be lined up at the door like a pack of hungry wolves. People love to single out the fast food industry for why people are fat. Because we need something to blame, and it's easy to blame the fast food industry because, as I said earlier, most people who eat fast food are poor people, and we love to shame anything that the poors eat. It's also not clear to me that fast food is actually uniquely bad for people. Yeah. I mean, I think if you look up the ingredients of most fast food, they're not that different than the ingredients of like a loaf of bread that you buy at the grocery store. Yeah. To me, it's like there's this much bigger systemic problem with the way that food is inspected, the way that food is produced. I think that McDonald's is bad, but it's not clear to me that they're worse than any other restaurant. Again, as you noted, the fucking Cheesecake Factory, man. (laughs) Dude, Applebee's has a lot to answer for. Sure. (laughs) Fast casual is, if anything, worse than fast food because your guard isn't up. I mean, I think a lot of this media around demonizing fast food, a lot of it really seems to presume that either... No one is consuming that media who eats at that restaurant. Right. Or there are people eating that food from that restaurant who are consuming this media as well. And they just need to be told the straight shit, which is that they're dummies for eating this fucking terrible food. And everybody knows it's bad for you. And why would you make such a bad decision? It's not a mystery as to why people falsely believe that rice and potatoes, other foods that the poor eat, is considered unhealthy in diet culture land. So not only does this parody make fun of and condescend to fat people, it's also extremely condescending to poor people and people of color. People of color who are more likely to be fat. This soda tax is meant to punish poor people for their bad decisions. As if food isn't already extremely expensive, poor people are already forced to buy less nutritious foods for their families because they're cheaper. If Leslie and Anne are so concerned about people eating less fast food, then why not advocate for making healthier foods at the grocery store more affordable to poor people? 
Oh, right. Because this isn't about helping poor people. It's about getting rid of the amount of fat people in Pawnee. There's even an episode where the show implies that preventing a 500-ounce soda from being sold at Ponchburger and adding a gym to the town reduced obesity and lowered rates of diabetes. They didn't push for a change in the food system or anything, didn't get rid of limitations for people on food stamps, didn't make healthy food more affordable, nope. Just added a soda tax and a gym and people just magically became thin. Here's the thing, if your goal is to lower the number of fat people in a city, you're already off to a bad start. The goal shouldn't be about getting rid of fat people because you are disgusted by them, it should be about health. And the episode titled Sweetums, Anne makes a really gross comment about fat kids. But Pawnee is the fourth most obese city in America. The kids here are beefy. They're just husky, big bone, plus size chunk monsters. I call them like I see them. She's talking about children. This is how people talk about fat people and fat children and then claim to be so concerned about their health. Calling a fat kid a chunk monster is not being concerned for their health. You're just being an asshole. Neither Parks and Rec or Super Size Me seem interested in even giving fat people a voice. It's just a bunch of white and thin middle class people deciding what they think is best for a group of people they are literally disgusted by. You cannot effectively help a group of people that you find repulsive. You can't help a group of people whom you've already decided are immoral and stupid. Now I already know that there are people who may watch this and may feel the need to comment on how it's a comedy and that is just jokes. A show being a comedy doesn't somehow mean that it's above criticism, first of all. People act like something being labeled as comedy or satirical means that it's untouchable, and that if you try to criticize a joke, you're being an oversensitive snowflake. Which is just stupid, because not all jokes are funny, not all jokes land with every single person, and this idea that people shouldn't be allowed to be offended by a joke is just a convenient way of saying, I don't like being criticized. We all know that words mean things and have weight to them. We all know that comedy has always been used as a way for bigoted people to express their bigotry. In the case of Parks and Rec, these particular jokes are used as a way to satirize the fake obesity epidemic. See, Pawnee isn't just a made-up city in Indiana, it's meant to represent America. Another frustrating thing with this show is the fact that Leslie Nope, a thin, conventionally attractive white woman, does not exactly have healthy eating habits herself. She eats a lot and loves waffles. Loving waffles is one of her quirks. Does she get criticized for her eating habits? No, of course not, she's thin. When thin people indulge in unhealthy foods, it's fine. It's fine for them to call themselves foodies and to talk about how much they love food while simultaneously talking down to fat people for how much and what they eat. Think Lorelai and Rory Gilmore. One of their major personality quirks is that they love food and love eating a lot of food. Then female characters who love food are almost presented as a joke at their expense. It's often presented as something to separate them from other women. We're not like other women who diet all the time. We like food. A running joke throughout Parks and Rec is the fact that Leslie hates salads. Can you imagine how this would be perceived if a fat character said the same thing? Ron Swanson, a mid-sized to small fat character, also loves food. In fact, we see him eating at Ponchburger multiple times throughout the series. Leslie literally buys him food from Ponchburger in that soda tax episode. But Ron is a man. That's his whole thing. He's a capital M man and he eats man food, so it's fine. It's not fine for poor Jerry, one of the show's fatter characters, to love food or to even do anything because everything he does is made into a joke. I think the treatment Jerry receives on this show is absolutely abysmal and the writers of this show should honestly be ashamed of themselves. I understand that he is meant to be sort of the Meg of the show. He's just the guy that everyone is mean to for no reason and the joke is more about how unbelievably cruel everyone is, but it's still hard to watch. In season 2 episode 19 titled Park Safety, Jerry is assigned to be a hummingbird feeder and Leslie is later informed that Jerry is in the hospital with a dislocated shoulder. Jerry tells them that he was mugged in the park while feeding the birds. Leslie, feeling guilty, orders everyone in the department to be nice to him from here on out. There's a scene where Jerry tries to present a slideshow to everyone, but as usual, makes a fool of himself when he bends over in his pants rip and he farts. Because as I forgot to mention, this is actually an episode of Spongebob. 
The park security ranger obtains footage of what actually happened in the park the day Jerry claimed he was mugged, and they learn that he was not in fact mugged. He's just such a dumb fatty that he dropped his burrito in the creek and tried to retrieve it and fell in. Because you know how fat people are, they love food so much that they would eat food out of a dirty creek. Just this morning, I fished a french fry out of a toilet because, well, you know us fatties. This episode is interesting because for one, it's sad that Jerry had to lie to his coworkers to avoid further bullying about his weight. And two, it's funny that the episode ends with Leslie saying that she needed to watch the video a few more times because it was that funny. But when Leslie literally tackled a woman because she fed a waffle to a dog, that wasn't funny because of her weight. No, no, no. That was funny because she loves waffles so much. Mind you, Leslie is supposed to be the nice character. Her whole personality is being nice. But when it comes to fat people, all that niceness goes out the window. Which is a perfect representation of how even progressive people are all too eager to go hard against fatness and fat people. There are moments where Leslie will just say the word obese and then just smirk. Like, haha, isn't it so funny that fat people exist and that they have diabetes? Isn't that so hilarious? Another running theme throughout the series is the fact that everyone in the Parks and Rec Department thinks that Jerry, due to his size and pathetic demeanor, has a miserable and sad life. When Ben, for example, learns that Jerry's wife is a conventionally attractive thin white woman, he is absolutely baffled as to why someone so hot would want Jerry. Like there are multiple scenes where Ben is trying to comprehend how their marriage happened. You know, I met Gail right here at Sherman. Mm -hmm. She was slender, blonde hair, big brass, long legs. Oh, not my type at all. And what was it exactly that led to you two hitting it off? Was she ill? Or did your father witness her father committing a crime? Or was she temporarily... You know what? Hey, while you were at Jerry's, did you happen to get any information about his history with Gail? Like, was she a Russian spy and the KGB forced her to marry Jerry as a cover? It's so incredibly mean and fucked up, but also realistic. People are always stunned at the fact that thin people find fat people attractive. Despite the fact that there are many fat people who date thin people, have babies with thin people, and fuck thin people. Look around, it's not that uncommon or unbelievable. At the risk of my video getting flagged, some of the most searched adult films is BBW adult films. There are people in this world who like seeing fat women get railed and think fat women are hot. Just because you personally do not find fat people attractive doesn't mean everyone else shares that opinion. People are drawn to each other for all kinds of reasons. This idea that only hot people date other hot people and if a hot person is dating someone that you consider to be ugly is pure projection. It is you who cannot wrap your head around the fact that not everyone is as shallow as you are. People always point to sitcom couples where the husband is always an average looking or sometimes fat man with a hot thin wife. That pairing is only baffling to you if you believe in the laws of attraction, which states that only certain types of people are attractive to certain types of people. These laws don't really apply to real life because like I said, people fall in love with each other for all kinds of reasons. Not everyone is obsessed with how much their partner weighs or whether or not they have an asymmetrical face or not. My only criticism of this trope is that you almost never see this with fat women. Fat women characters are typically always partnered with other fat men. Think Paula from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend or Kate from This Is Us. There's obviously nothing wrong with two fat people dating, but, but there is a conversation to be had around why writers can't imagine a fat woman with someone who isn't fat. Despite that, I actually do like the irony that Jerry's life is perfect as a way to counter what everyone at his job thinks about him. But the only reason that would be ironic is because he's fat. It's also disappointing that the way his character is treated never seems to change. April Ludgate, for example, slowly kind of evolves throughout the series and starts to actually care about her job, while still retaining her sarcasm and sardonicism. The same can't be said for Jerry. He's just a big, dumb, dummy, dumb, dumb who constantly embarrasses himself, but still for some reason likes his coworkers even though they all hate him and treat him like shit. In season five, episode 18, titled Jerry's Retirement, Jerry retires and due to his absence from the office, causes everyone in the office to try and find someone else that they can dunk on and ridicule. When they fail to do this, Ron asks Jerry to come in every day for two hours so that they can have someone to make fun of. And he comes back, and it just makes you question what even the point of this episode was. 
Now, it doesn't seem like the show is 100% condoning this kind of behavior. It does seem like they're trying to point out how sad it is that they need to have someone in the office to make fun of. But the show never challenges this. It would have been cool if Jerry came back with more confidence and began to stand up for himself more. But nope, the status quo must remain. Now, some of you might be asking, well, what about Donna? And to that I'd say, what about Donna? The show is still playing into some anti-fat tropes with her as well. The whole joke with her is that it's funny that everyone finds this fat black woman to be attractive and that she has a way with men. Lots of men find her attractive and she also, according to her, has had many sexual partners. This is only funny if the person isn't considered to be conventionally attractive. Anne is also extremely conventionally attractive and lots of men around town are attracted to her. But that's not presented as a joke because she's thin. I would say Donna's treatment isn't as overtly awful as the treatment of Jerry, of course. I actually really like Donna because I like Retta and she's funny. I would also say the show is playing into this trope that fat black women are extremely confident and domineering. It's one of those tropes that isn't overtly terrible, but it's still perpetuating this idea that black women are always no-nonsense, sassy, flawless, and are always in control of their lives. The thing about Parks and Recreation is that even though it is extremely unquestionably anti-fat, It's also a fantastic accidental metaphor for how people on the left treat fat people. They want to help fat people in this pitying and condescending way, but aren't interested in actually listening to fat people and their concerns. In that article about Aubrey Gordon I mentioned earlier, she says, quote, We make it clear that we want to rid the world of fat people when we advance policies related to the quote-unquote obesity epidemic, a framework that insists that the mere existence of fat people is a threat to them people. Programs like Let's Move and the National Task Force don't take aim at preventing diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, mental health, or any other specific health concerns. Instead, they take aim at a body type, making two-thirds of Americans enemy combatants in a war we never wanted. We'll make it clear, too, when we advance sugary beverage taxes, focusing more on the weight gain sodas can cause than their myriad of direct preventable harms to public health. We make it clear that we will readily mock and deride fat people when we create and buy into fat caricatures of political boogeymen. We disproportionately characterize conservative people as fat and poor, using the two as a shorthand for backward regressive thinking. Trump voters are depicted wearing ill-fitting, food-stained Confederate flag and MAGA shirts, despite the fact that most Trump supporters are affluent, not working class. We do all of that without regard for what it says about us, much less what it says about the fat people we know and love. We champion the war on obesity and the childhood obesity epidemic without regard for what our tactics actually do to the fat people, including the fat children we hold dear. Yes, we have passively accepted scripts that were staged long before our time, but each time we recite their lines, we send a clear message that we don't respect fat people and that fat people's dignity isn't worth considering. Unquote. Another thing I don't think a lot of people think about in terms of anti-fat bias is the fact that anti-fat bias stems from anti-blackness. When you participate in anti-fatness and perpetuate anti-fatness, you are perpetuating and participating in anti-blackness. Black people are more likely to be poor, they are more likely to be fat, and bear the brunt of anti-fatness. In Belly of the Beast, the politics of anti-fatness as anti-blackness, Deshaun L. Harrison, a fat, black, disabled, trans, and non-binary writer, writes, quote, According to the World Health Organization, health is the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not just the absence of disease or infirmity. As I interpret it, this means that for one to be healthy, they must not only be non-disabled, but also must be in an environment that allows for them to feel mentally secure, physically safe, and socially well. As such, this means that Black people, especially those of us who exist with multiple marginalized identities, are always already unhealthy because we are always already unsafe, unquote. They continue later saying, quote, In Fearing the Black Body, the Racial Origins of Fat Phobia, Sabrina Strings massively details how fatness on the Black subject's body set the precedent for how fatness would be engaged in the United States and the world as a whole. Fatness was once seen as something to aspire to, something that was attractive. The reason for this, however, was because, at the time, fatness signified socio-political and economic power. What Strings makes clear in Fearing the Black Body is that it was fatness's alignment with whiteness that really made it attractive to Europeans. When Europeans saw Africans for the first time and saw that their bodies looked like them, but their skin did not, it was then that anti-fatness was established as a coherent ideology. Because fatness had become blackened, 
it could only ever be impure and beastly. As the slave represented capital and forced labor, fatness could no longer be about status and power, so it became about greed and ungodliness, unquote. Many people may not be aware of the ties between fat phobia and anti-blackness, and that's okay, because we can't know everything, and it's never too late to learn things. Most of the information we get around health, weight, and wellness is mostly trash. In the Super Size Me documentary, Morgan uses the infamously false statistic that 400,000 Americans die of obesity every year. That number has been debunked for years now, but because we live in such a fatphobic society and we're so eager to grasp onto anything that will confirm that anti-fat worldview, people continue to use that false statistic. It uncritically and repeatedly uses the 300,000 deaths each year from obesity number. Oh, Uh our old friend on the show. Mortality estimates are really hard to get to in terms of like isolating a single cause for someone's death. Right. And that 300,000 deaths number came from, we assume that every fat person who died, died of being fat. Right. both Super Size Me and Parks and Rec consistently tie diabetes to obesity, even though all kinds of people with all kinds of body types have diabetes. And there really is no set explanation for why people get diabetes in the first place. Honestly, just go and listen to the Maintenance Phase podcast. There's a really great episode called Zombie Statistics, where Michael Hobbs really gets into the weeds when it comes to these garbage statistics. They're both way smarter than me and have done extensive research debunking a lot of junk science around health, wellness, and dieting. I personally am more interested in humans and human behavior, because regardless of whether or not fast food does make you fat, or whether or not being fat does cause all of these health issues, is this an ethical way of helping people? It really doesn't make sense to claim to be concerned about the health of fat people, and then go around town capturing footage of fat people wearing sweatpants and drinking soda so that you can exploit them and use their bodies as a way of fear-mongering. These images have been baked into many people's brains. It may not have been the sole cause of a lot of people's anti-fat bias, but it definitely exacerbated it. It doesn't make sense to claim to be so concerned about the health of fat people while simultaneously making people feel bad about how they look. Fat shaming does not lead to weight loss. In fact, it leads to weight gain. And even if it did lead to weight loss, why would that be a good thing? I find it very disturbing that some people feel that it is a necessary evil to fat shame people so that they can become thin. I don't see how you can even consider yourself to even be a decent person if that's the logic you abide by. We all know that shaming someone's appearance does not have a healthy effect on people's mental health and self-esteem. We know this when it comes to racism and colorism. Black people who have experienced shame and bullying because of being dark-skinned can tell you that. Part of the reason people seem to have such a hard time empathizing with fat people is because we genuinely feel that fat people chose to be fat. And that losing weight isn't that hard when that is simply not true. There are a million, jillion reasons why people are fat or why some people can't lose weight. But if I told you, would you care? And if people did choose to be fat, why would that bother you? If you actually want people to be healthy and well, you have to see them as people first. You have to unlearn your biases and you have to actually give them a voice and listen to them. I encourage those of you who might push back and get some of the points I've made in this video to read up on some of this stuff. I'll be leaving links in the description on all the things I talked about in this video. If you consider yourself to be someone who is concerned about fat people, then you should be interested in what fat people have to say. And you should be interested in hearing about their experiences. Because we all know a fat person. We all know a lot of fat people. Many of you watching are probably fat. So why wouldn't you want to do better by them? (sighs) Damn, now I want some McDonald's.